first uh, big panel of the day, and what can I tell you? It's an all-female panel <laughs> talking about food and agriculture. <laughs> all right, I love that. So we want to make sure to leave time for audience questions, both people in the room and people who are watching us virtually. So um, keep that in mind. And I, we have had a prep call, and I warned all of our panelists that I would like them to address three questions. Um, and we will just go in order from left to right. And here are the questions I asked them to think about. First, we're here talking about next gen. From where you sit, how do you um, encounter this reality? What's the problem as you see it? Two, there must be a reason you're on this panel, right? So how are you engaged in this issue? What is your organization or what you personally, what are you doing around mm -hmm. issues about next gen? And third, because I'm a very solution-oriented person, if you had a magic wand, wouldn't we all love one? But if you had a magic wand, how would you use it? So I'm not going to go through biographical descriptions of all these people because that is included in your program. Uh, we don't want to use time for that, but I've got really talented people, as you will see. And we're going to start with you, MJ. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And, and thank you, Danny and, and Food Tank, for inviting me to, to speak on today's panel. I'm honored and excited to be here. I also wanted to quickly thank the farmers on today's panel and out here in the audience and, and out here watching, because obviously your perspectives are, are really key for this discussion. And I'm glad that Danny has privileged your voices. Uh, I am not a farmer, but I come from a long line of farmers. And actually, uh, ahead of today's discussion, I decided to call my grandpa, my 84-year-old retired farmer um, grandpa, who, you know, he's got some great life experiences. And I wanted to get his take. And when I asked him about the future of farming and the future of food leaders, you know, some of the things that he mentioned to me that he faces are some of the same problems that smallholder farmers all over the globe are facing. And that's really who I'm here to represent. I work for a nonprofit right here in DC called World Food Program USA. And what we do is we support global hunger relief. And one of the things that I've learned in my time at World Food Program USA is that half of the world's hungry people are poor smallholder farmers, farmers who tend less than five acres. And it's one of the cruelest ironies of, of global hunger today, that the people who grow food for a living are the same people who are hungry. And many of these smallholder farmers, most of whom, by the way, are women, are facing the same issues that family farms in the US are facing, a lack of, of access to land, to financial capital, to technology, to training. And I think from where I sit, that's one of the biggest challenges the fact that so many of the world's farmers are not able to be successful and are living hand to mouth. And you know, when you're talking about solutions, the, the organization that World Food Program USA supports, it's the UN World Food Program. And so many of the solutions and, and the ways that they're working with smallholder farmers are incredibly smart, but also shockingly simple. Mm. And I'm gonna give you one example, a homegrown school meal. You can probably figure out what that might mean, but for those of you who don't know, basically a homegrown school meal is when the UN connects a poor farmer with their local school and uses the crops that they grow to source nutritious, fresh breakfasts and lunches. So last summer, I, I had the chance to meet one of these farmers who's doing these homegrown school meals projects with the UN in Cambodia. And this man's name was Yoon and he is growing fresh spinach and cucumbers that are being used to feed children in the local school. And what's even better is that he has a daughter who attends that school. So because of this model, he has a reliable buyer in the UN World Food Program. He knows he's going to get a fair price. And he also knows that he's helping nourish his daughter and her classmates. And I love that, that idea. I think it's a really powerful idea. It's an empowering idea. And it's a rather you know, elegant solution to two problems, lifting these poor farmers out of poverty, and at the same time, feeding children in the world's 
porous classrooms. So I know I'm getting close to time. Um, I threatened them all with gaveling them out she if they really went over did, time. Though. I'm really mean, moderator. <laughs> um, if I had a magic wand, I think maybe what I would do might surprise you, but if I had a magic wand, I would build all of the infrastructure needed to help the world's farmers succeed. Mm. Because the things that make or break agriculture are not always the most obvious things. Things like roads and bridges so that farmers can transport their crops to market. Good airtight silos to prevent their harvested crops from be, uh, you know, becoming infested by mold or insects or rats. Um, I think it's just really, it's really important to, to remember that food production draws on so many different sectors. Water, transportation, finance. And the World Food Program is doing that too. They have these projects called Food for Assets, where they encourage a community to build roads or water reservoirs or irrigation canals and create that environment for local farmers to succeed. Um, you know, I think we hear a lot that young people aren't interested in farming, but I, I wonder if it's not that they're just, they're more interested in doing it differently than the way their parents did. And I think because food production draws on so many different sectors, what that means is young people today can be involved in agriculture in so many different ways. And it's a really exciting kind of idea. I mean, you can, you can help the world produce food in a lot of different fields. And WFP, the World Food Program, is doing that too. So, you know, when we're talking about infrastructure, it's not just physical in infrastructure, it's telecommunications. How do these poor farmers in really remote areas get access to new buyers, to weather forecasts, to seed prices. And the World Food Program has created an app in Zambia using really basic SMS technology. They're calling it a virtual farmer's market so that farmers can do just that. Because shockingly, even in the most remote corners of the world, really basic cell phones have made huge inroads. And I just think that's a really, it's a, it's a powerful idea and it's an exciting idea and it's a reminder why agriculture is a, a really sexy you know, occupation if you think about it, if I can use that term. So I wanna leave you guys with something that a colleague of mine uh, at World Food Program USA told me recently by way of describing farming and I think it's a really powerful description and I'm gonna read it because I'm gonna butcher it which is why I have my notes here. Never forget the miracle of the industry in which you are involved. Farmers harvest bundles of light and energy from a distant sun to produce the food we eat. And the soil in which they do it is the only thing on earth that takes death and decay and turns it back into life. And that is the miracle of farming. So I'll just leave that thought with you. Thank you, thank yeah. you. And um, you did your grandfather proud first of all. And secondly, I wanted to say you, you acknowledge the, the farmers on the panel, but you're also a great reminder that when we talk next gen, we also need people to populate important organizations that support farmers, um, need to join the halls of Congress, uh, the executive branch. So there's a lot of work to go around. Emily, you're here. You're a you're a dairy farmer, you do other things, you're part of the Organic Valley Cooperative. That's right. Welcome, what do you have to tell us? Oh, thanks, so yeah, I've been um, a young farmer for 12 years now. So <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, I actually married into uh, full-time farming, I just grew up on a, a hobby farm, but um, the challenges that we see and the problems, the problem as I see it as a young farmer um, has always been that sustainable living wage. Um, the, the issues that MJ spoke to are almost the same that we have here in the United States, you know, that might surprise you, but um, just on a different scale or maybe, uh, you know, a different emphasis on, on certain aspects of those. Um, for us, when my husband and I joined our, um, he grew up on the dairy farm that we, um, we work on now and own uh, now, and um, he's the fourth generation there, but when we wanted to come back, you know, the big discussion was how do we make a living? Um, because if there isn't going to be an income, then there's no point. And um, his parents are actually fairly young. They're in their, their 50s, which is young for a farmer. But um, I think that's young. Yeah, and they're, uh, they're not looking to retire yet. So you know, we had a lot of those big discussions of how do we make a sustainable living wage 
because we don't want to live in poverty why we do this. You know, it's, it's our passion, it's our livelihood. Mm -hmm. This is not a hobby for us. This is not something that we're going to do on the weekends and then, you know, pat ourselves on the back for. So, um, you know, those were, you know, intense conversations around the dinner table of how we were going to make that happen. Um, why I'm on the panel is luckily for us, we had the opportunity back in 2006, 2007 to join an organization of farmers, an Organic Valley Cooperative, that would be able to make that reality come true. Um, you know, a farmer-based organization that's grassroots, that has the farmer in mind, the board is run by farmers, the pay price is set by farmers, is just so important. Um, to, it was very important to us when we were making those decisions because it really spoke volumes to us that we were going to be able to sustain our business, not only for um, my husband's parents to then get into retirement years down the line. I mean, we're still talking years down the line for them and us to sustain an income, but maybe have a hope to our children as well for the future. So um, that has been a model that has worked very well um, for us in our situation where we're at. Um, Back in 2008, when we finally for, uh, shipped our first um, uh, truckload of Organic Valley milk, um, many of you know 2008 as the year of the Great Recession. So it was a very tough time um, in our industry at that time, and we were particularly nervous because it had always been, it, it wasn't a policy on the books, but it was just something that was known for members um, of Organic Valley, that if you were the last one on the truck, you'd be the first one off. And so we knew that we were literally the last ones on the truck before um, the financial crisis hit. And so we were, you know, in this limbo, are we going to stay or are we going to go back to a conventional, you know, type market? And um, thankfully, you know, part of an organization that is farmers, for farmers, Organic Valley said, everybody is staying on the truck. We are going to work together to get through this. We all took just a small hit. We all went on a little quota system where we just had to pull back a little bit. We made it through that recession and we came out stronger. And that, I mean, that just spoke so much to us. I mean, we were seeing friends, you know, being dropped from their, um, you know, conventional co-ops or their contracts from processors. And it was just very sad. And we're actually back into that same cycle right now. So not too far you know, in the future from that point, we're seeing that same thing happen in the dairy industry again. And it, it's just heartbreaking. Because you know, on average, we have to work a minimum of 10 to hours a day. I mean, that's just milking cows. And so when you give up that livelihood, you're giving up a lot more than just a paycheck. So being part of a, a system that is for farmers, by farmers, um, just really understands the issues that we're going through and really strives to pro provide a living wage um, is, is, is very important. I think there's a lot of other models out there besides Organic Valley that are doing that and um, seeing, kind of seeing what we have done and, and taking that and really working for the farmers. Um, and farmers really taking that lead too and saying this is what we want for our industry. You know, we, we want to have that voice. We want to be a part of that discussion and uh, not just, just producing a commodity and letting it go on the truck and, and not knowing where it goes. So if I had a magic wand, um, I think it's, it's really just giving the farmers, whether it's in Cambodia or the United States or wherever it may be, really just giving them the opportunity to have that voice and be part of that discussion versus just um, producing an input to an end means. Because if you can be doing that, um, you're really um, setting farmers up to have that sustainable living wage and being able to produce continually through the future. Thank you. So we've got some thoughts on infrastructure. We have some thoughts on farmer organization cooperatives and empowering voices. And Teresa, what do you want us to know? Um, well, I'm here in the capacity of a researcher. I'm not a farmer. I would love to be one one day, though. Um, but I think besides climate change and the impacts of climate change um, affecting the island and Jamaica, um, I think one of the most undervalued um, issue that needs to be tackled is the, the challenge of technical support and institutional support. Um, Jamaica has had tremendous setbacks over the years, um, and the farmers, specifically the agricultural sector, has had tremendous setbacks. 
um, I think one of the main things, for example, the policies um, encouraged, strongly encouraged by the IMF and the World Bank um, kind of put a damper on the production of the agricultural sector, kind of put a damper on the livelihoods <laughs> of our farmers. Um, I think MJ touched on some of the things that are important, such as the infrastructure. Um, but at, currently, the, the agricultural sector is so, I don't want to, kind of backward in terms of the support for its farmers, right? Um, for example, our state agency, RADA, um, the extension services that they offer, there are like one extension officer services 100 farmers. And <laughs> you can see that that can do much, right? So our farmers are really lacking the technical support um, in terms of knowledge of markets, uh, the technical support in terms of uh, infrastructure and technologies and all of that. So I think that's a, that's a major challenge that we're facing. Um, working with farmers on different projects over the years, there's one question that I always ask every farmer that I interact with. Would you, would you support your, your children or your child entering the agricultural sector? Mm. And the, most of the time the answer is always no. Why? Because they, they don't want that same challenge and hardship for their children, right? And I think that's, that's something that we need to really tackle um, radically because um, our, our farmers are like average age 50, 55. So if they don't want their younger generation to be in farming, then we're going to be in problem, right? So um, I think that's, that's one of the major issues. And you know, the younger generation see, see farmers or see their parents um, going through these challenges, going through these tough times um, as a farmer, and they don't want to go down that road, right? Um, so I think that's something that we need to, to tackle head on. Um, in terms of uh, UWE as a research institution, um, we have, we've had a lot of research in terms of developing the agricultural sector, research through um, in looking at organic farming, research looking at uh, pesticides, using natural pesticides instead of the chemical alternatives. Um, and I think researchers at the university, they're trying to bridge that gap between the science aspect and policy, not just doing research to add to that body of knowledge uh, within the science field, but also to kind of um, encourage advocacy, right? To ensure that our farmers are getting the assistance that they need based on the data that's there. Um, in terms of the magic wand, um, I would solve climate change for sure. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, but I think working with BCFN, um, I've, I've been privileged to um, kind of be a part of that knowledge of learning about food waste. And I've gotten a strong interest in that. Um, and I think if we can reduce food waste, I would use the magic wand to do that, if I can reduce food waste, I think that will bring a significant dent in world hunger, from my, my perspective. Um, I think, when growing up, I think, for example, uh, cattle and cows, they usually feed on grass. That's, the, that's, the, that's what I've grown up knowing. Um, but then now you have a corn being given to cattle. You have corn being used as fuel, right? I think if we can reduce food waste and kind of dis, um, break down the power structures uh, that encourage these sort of 
um, actions, then I think we can make a major dent in world hunger and then we don't have to be having this conversation again in the next 30 years. Right? So that's my, that's my oh, thing. You wand, know, magic you, wand. You broke my heart when you said that in, in Jamaica, parents are advising their children mm -hmm. not to go into agriculture. It's very true here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And to think that that could be happening globally is just soul crushing. But thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maisha, what do you have to tell us? All right, uh, so first, um, I'd like to give thanks uh, to those who came before me, uh, my ancestors. We are closing out Black History Month even though black history is happening now and it's a recurring thing. So the folks who came before us, uh, George Washington Carver, Booker T. Washington, Ida B. Wells. Um, and then my personal story of my family. Um, I come from a, a family of farmers on my dad's side uh, from North Carolina. Um, but yes, I am a, an urban farmer. I grew up in Washington, D.C. and have done um, a lot of urban farming um, and just, immersing myself in the experience. Um, and I was thinking about uh, today, like, okay, you know, what do I see as the challenge? There's so many challenges. And if I am to speak from my personal experience, um, just, just understanding or realizing that the opportunities and the resources to get into agriculture um, are not the same uh, just across the board. Um, I, my, my first journey in agriculture began when I was in the second grade. I did a, a garden club. I did it, I uh, like being outside, playing in the dirt, uh, but I didn't see this as a, as a career option. Um, very much so in, in urban communities, you know, we're taught to go to college or get a good job. And, and that was the trajectory that I was on, going, you know, went to school to study sociology, was very much interested in, in solving social problems. Um, through research and, and wanting to be a professor. Um, and then uh, as my journey unfolded, you know, I really started to ask questions about health in our communities. Um, you know, why so many statistics say that people of color are suffering from diabetes, high blood pressure, all of these different things. Um, and then just having personal experiences of people in my family uh, dying from these causes, which really spurred my, my, my inspiration to learn more. Um, so I just, you know, I started working in community gardens, um, starting gardens, asking a lot of questions, uh, making relationships with people who were already in the industry. And uh, not surprising, but surprising, the industry is led by white, men, white women and white men. Um, who I'm very thankful for, for investing in, you know, my journey. Um, but I wonder, you know, if they weren't there to say, hey, you should check out this program in North Carolina for farming, or hey, let me put you on this listserv where there's gonna be opportunities coming in day in, day out of, you know, jobs, uh, panel discussions, lectures, urban, you know, different farms, would I be here today? Um, so. From my perspective, you know, one of the, the, the challenges um, for brown and black people is accessing, you know, educational opportunities, uh, resources, and just being in a network of people who are doing the work. Um, as far as like my experience um, with, you know, in the industry, I have had an opportunity to work on a 33-acre um, certified organic farm in Goldsboro, North Carolina to work on a dairy farm to really get into that, which I did not see happening as an inner city kid from DC, like actually milking farms, learning how to communicate with cows, uh, doing research, <laughs> which that was a completely crazy experience. Um, you know, working with researchers in high tunnels, learning how to build high tunnels. And you know, I had to take myself away from the setting that I was used to being in North Carolina alone, I mean, I had family down there, but I was, you know, I was in a new setting. But I feel like that experience has, uh, has shaped me and has, has given me the tools to go back into my community and show people what is possible. So, you know, really, really, I think what, what I enjoy about urban farming is it's not just farming, you know. We, 
you know, we might be on the urban farm and, you know, we're talking about issues that we're dealing with in our family. So it then becomes a healing field um, where, you know, we're sharing information about how to file our taxes. Uh, you know, I'm talking about, oh, you should meet this person. So in the journey, I've connected with so many brown and black farmers throughout the nation just because we all, you know, deal with some of the same challenges. How do, where do we go to look for jobs? Most of the time when we're looking for opportunities and the organizations and you go on a, a website, um, a company's website, and you don't see anybody who looks like you. Um, so that, that has really shaped, you know, how I move in the food system and the organization that I'm working with, which uh, Dreaming Out Loud, we're a cooperative um, social enterprise, we kind of address all of those different components. So we have a two acre urban farm where it's partnered with the, with the, with the middle school and the Department of Parks and Rec. So, you know, and it's situated right in the community. So being able to show the community what is possible in your neighborhood and then having a workforce development program that pay people $15 an hour. So, you know, I mean, farming, when I first started, I was an AmeriCorps member with Civic Works Real Food Farm and I was being paid minimum wage. Granted, there were a lot of opportunities and, and exposure, um, but that, 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 that salary was not going to allow me to be <laughs> where I am now. Um, and then we also have a, a, an entrepreneurship program, which I'm running, um, that, is, that is built to help brown and black food businesses in D.C. to thrive, because that is also a gap in the food system, is that some people just can't, don't have access to the capital, knowledge of, you know, regulations, how do, they, how do we move in these spaces? Um, and then we do policy and advocacy work as well. And I guess if I had a magic wand, I mean, I would just go back to the problem. It would be to uh, create equitable um, access to resources, um, educational opportunities, and networks for, for people of color. Great. Heal and feel on the farm. And you are really right to bring up issues of social justice, equity. Uh, you know, for decades, 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 we have not addressed them. And it's 2018 and it's time. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud that uh, Chris Bradshaw is on the GW Institute Advisory Council, the, the Food Institute. You guys are doing great work and encouraging uh, people from a variety of communities to come to the table is really what's needed if we're going to solve any of the big problems in front of us. So thank you. Jenny, round up our panel. Sure. So good morning. My name is Jenny Schmidt. Um, I farm here in Maryland, and we are on the eastern shore um, of Maryland. It's a large family farm. It's um, third generation. I would say I'm the first generation I married into the farm, and farming is my second career. Uh, my bachelor's and my master's degree are in clinical nutrition, and I worked as a registered dietitian for a number of years before um, I worked my way into uh, getting a job on the farm, which was really what my passion was. So I bring to the table an interesting perspective of nutrition on both ends of the spectrum, from the clinical nutrition perspective, which I no longer practice, haven't practiced as a dietitian for 15 years. Um, but that's the foundation from which I operate my farm in looking at um, the, the fruits and vegetables and grains um, that we grow and the methods of farming uh, that we use. I'm also kind of the bridge, I think, generation here. Sadly, I'm maybe not too much younger than Emily's parent, uh, in-laws, um, <laughs> in that my children are in their late teens, early 20s. I have a couple of nephews in their early 20s. Um, and so we inherited the farm from my father-in-law, um, who at 65 actually retired and handed over the business to, um, to my husband and my brother-in-law when they were in their late 20s and early 30s. So we've been fortunate that we've actually been the owners of the farm for the past 20 years. Um, most farmers don't hand the reins over to the operation until they pass. And so it's unusual that we will have been owners for as long um, as we have and very fortunate um, in that. Um, so on, on the Eastern Shore, we till about 2,000 acres. So we're very large for the state of Maryland. Um, we're not that large in the big scheme of agriculture in, in the US. Um, Purdue Poultry is the largest uh, chicken uh, processor in this, in this, and it's headquartered here in Maryland. 
So if you cross over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, um, you'll find large rural open fields with lots of corn and soybean, not unlike um, the, the Midwest. Um, and so we also grow canning vegetables for a canning company in Pennsylvania because the Mid-Atlantic is so small. We consider ourselves a grocery store farm. Everything that we grow becomes an ingredient um, that a consumer will buy in the grocery store. We don't do any direct to consumer sales. Um, it is me and my brother-in-law operating the farm. We have some seasonal crew uh, with the vineyard, mostly to do the handwork. The kids are not particularly interested right now. Um, one's in high school, the others are all in college. They've worked the vineyard for a number of years, baled hay for a number of years as kids. And I think when farm kids grow up, they don't appreciate working their butts off all summer long and after school and every single weekend. Um, and so I think farm kids are looking for what you all see is out there in life. What's the opportunities for me to move up the ladder and maybe not work as hard or be stuck on the farm um, like my parents are because you know I, my, my kids are impressed. I chose to be on the farm. I had a career off the farm. And, um, and so that's uh, I think the important part of looking at that perspective is your opportunities to influence the next generation. They're still very young. My husband at 26 did not know that he really wanted to return to the farm, but he did. Um, because he really didn't know what else to do with himself. And so that's, um, you know, and that's, that's kind of a lot of times how the transition happens in families. Um, so if, if I had a, a magic wand, I would maybe reduce our hours to work so that the kids are actually interested in doing um, farming. I, I, that's a really difficult question. I think what's, um, what's really important for us, we're, we are not certified organic anymore. We used to be a number of years ago, but we call ourselves what we call synergistic, meaning we use every tool in the toolbox we can to move our farm along that sustainability continuum, whether it's cover crops, no-till agriculture, crop rotation, all of those things are standard operating procedures for us is what we call a quote-unquote conventional farm. I don't know any farmer that really puts a moniker on themselves other than they are a farmer. Um, and so for, uh, for me, the wand would be to let's look at the whole food system, regardless of the system that they're, in, that they're using, and move all of us along that sustainability continuum and do away with sort of this tribalism within the food system of you are this or you're here or you're here and dispense with the echo chamber within those discussions and make it more broader and more open. Great, thank you. So it's Q&A time, guys. And we've talked about this. I know someone asked a question and the impulse is for every panel member to answer that question, but we're not gonna do that because we wanna get more questions out. And I'm gonna start with one that's come in on Twitter because it's very relevant to the discussion we just had. And I'm actually gonna move over to Emily and address the question to you. And it is, uh, so Ann Therese uh, uh, talked about how parents don't encourage young people to go into farming. What advice do you have for elders to encourage people to go into far young, young people to go into farming. So we heard maybe it's about trying to restructure the farm in a way that it's not horrendous hours that these young people see. Yeah. And of course, I'm talking now to a dairy farmer. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> what advice do you have? Yeah, uh, I think Jenny, you know, hit the nail on the head there about um, you know us working overworking our kids. And my husband and I have really um, been we. we we think about this a lot. We have three children, they're 10, nine, and six. So they're, they're young, but they're already helping us on the farm, collecting eggs, helping you know, after milking and that sort of thing. And, and just um, trying to, as a family, realize that farm, farming is who we are, but it's not all who we are. And so we try to get away. You know, we try, my you know, husband's with me this weekend, you know, seeing the parents get away, seeing their grandparents get away, being involved in things um, outside of our farm and our community. And, in our churches and, and different things like that, and just taking a, a really holistic and healthy approach to it. Um, we've had, uh, I personally have had um, family members dealing with mental health issues, and so just really making sure that uh, we keep our own mental health good, 
um, so our, our children see that and just see it as a positive thing. And we've talked to our kids um, about you know, the inter different enterprises they can do on our farm and get them excited about that. Um, you know, the chickens and the eggs, I mean, it's easy for them to start there. And if they want to return to the farm, that's great. If they don't, that is, that is good too, you know, as long as you know, they have a positive experience growing up on where they are. So we are very, very conscious of that and talk about that a lot, actually, on our farm. And Teresa, do you want to add a word on yes. that since you started this conversation? Yes. Um, I think young people, majority of them, I think they, they don't like to work and work hard. Um, and I think, yeah, I think they try to, what their parents did in like took 20 years to do, they're trying to do it in two. Um, and it's kind of good and bad, because you know, farming kind of teach you patience, um, build stamina. Um, but I think if young persons or young people can apply uh, the technology and new ways of thinking to farming, right? That's that's suitable to them. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do it the way your parents did it. But you can get the uh, similar results, or even better results, right? So I think that's something they should consider. Don't look at it as a menial work. Um, you eat food every day, it comes from somewhere, right? And um, I think starting at a younger age, teaching children to respect the farm, respect the idea of what farmers represent, you know? Um, and eventually, I think they can find their own path and create their own wealth um, and health from, the, from farming the soil. I'm going to take my first question from the audience. Who's going to raise their hand? I know we have mics. Okay, I've got a person right here in row number two. Why don't you stand up and they'll hand you the mic. And you're going to keep it nice and short for me. I know you will. Hi, uh, my name is Brandi Curley. I'm with the Kenai Peninsula Food Bank in Alaska. And we're trying to develop um, young growers and get them involved uh, specifically in sustainable nutrition. So how would you recommend, and this is for Maisha, um, to, to get them started in other parts of the country looking for co-ops and information and knowledge sources? Can you, yeah, can you repeat the question? So how to get young people involved? Yeah, getting them connected with other farmers, with other growers, with other um, uh, place-specific knowledge resources. Place-specific knowledge resources. How do we connect people up around that? Place-specific. So let's see. How did I do it? Um, <laughs> well, one, I started with and just kind of where I was, which was in, I started farming in Baltimore. And Baltimore had its like, own network. But then I would like to say like, oh, do you know anybody who's doing this work in another place? And then, I mean, it, it kind of like, I don't know, like the, the <coughs> I don't really know if I have the answer, honestly. <laughs> Um, but there are networks, like you can look on LinkedIn, you know what I mean, for organizations doing the, you know, the work that you, that you may be interested in. Um, I use hashtags on social media, so like if I'm interested in like sustainable agriculture or urban farming or black farmers, typically I'll just put in a hashtag and that can ha kind of direct me to people. And then, I mean, just generally just asking questions. Like, do you know somebody who's doing the work here? And then kind of putting together a resource list. So when I was um, a farm manager, I had a resource list that I then shared with uh, people who were interested in and did what I could to connect them. I think the power of networking and social media is incredible. I got an email the other day from a person that I went on a farm tour with in December who referred a dietetic intern to me who was looking for an agriculture piece of her dietetic internship. And it all just connected because of social media. And I think that's a real powerful mechanism more current today than it used to be. And take advantage of today, everybody, right? We've got people who've come together at the Food Tech Summit because they have concerns about next gen issues and food and agriculture. So network the heck out of the break periods and lunch and 
the after day events um, and really build up your own network. So it'd be great. Now I'm going to take the next one from Twitter. MJ, I'm going to direct this one to you from Hunger Notes. We have many young readers. What is the best advice for young people who want to engage in food security and hunger issues? You know, I, I think I would echo actually what, what was just said about uh, social media and, and the various networks that are already out there. Um, from the perspective of World Food Program USA, there are a lot of different ways that we engage young people. And one of the, the cooler and more recent ones is actually a smartphone app called Share the Meal. And it was created two years ago by the UN World Food Program. And to date, it has raised enough money through crowdsourcing on this app to feed 20 million people, which is really wow. incredible. Mm -hmm. And what's cool about it is you can, all of you here, and I hope that a couple of you do, download the app right now on your phone. And you can learn about how the World Food Program is reaching hungry children in Syria, in Yemen, in South Sudan, in Bangladesh. And you can learn about these families. And um, actually next week, uh, we're gonna be launching through that app a new program to connect uh, individuals here in the U.S. with families, specific families, where WFP operates. And you're going to be able to, to learn about how your donation is helping these families purchase food. So that's one kind of really interesting way that I think young people can get involved. And it, it sort of turns the idea of, of fundraising on its head a little bit. Great. OK, this part of the audience, I need a question from over here. Got someone right here on the aisle. Easy, easy peasy. Good morning, Vanessa Garcia, Rhode Island Food Policy Council. My question for you is: the young people and the young the young farmers and your leaders that we are that are going to agriculture and food systems work. How would you prevent them from romanticizing agriculture? That's something that I experience a lot. A lot of people, I get a text message from a friend like, "I just rented an acre and I'm going to become a garlic grower." He has never grown anything before. <laughs> And, and also, we also have a lot of the young people that are thinking just by being foodies and Instagramming farm-to-table restaurants, they are becoming food systems advocates. <laughs> so how do we prevent romanticizing food systems work? Thank you. I'm going to start. Jenny, why don't you start with that? Um, gosh, that's an interesting question. Uh, we do a lot of farm tours for us. Um, I'm a pretty transparent person, I'll tell you the way it is. Um, ask my kids. <laughs> And, uh, you know, trying to explain or have people walk through a day with us and what we do, um, you know, in season to, uh, to manage the different crops that we have, to manage the number of acres that we have. It is two people, me and my brother-in-law. Um, and so that's a, 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 I guess maybe adopt a farm kid because that would be, have an adoption program where you get to be a farm kid for a certain number of weeks or days or internships because I think that really is the, the biggest challenge is the romantic notion behind the hell of a lot of work that we put in to produce the, the food um, that we do. May, should you have a thought on this? Yes. <laughs> I was gonna say, encourage them to do the work, whether they're mm -hmm. volunteering mm -hmm. at a farm and they set up an internship, because I would say, when I first got into it, I kind of romanticized it. Mm -hmm. I remember I, uh, like the first time I like planted all these beds of spinach on my farm, and then I had to harvest them, and it was like 30, 40 degree weather, and I was like, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they just have to put themselves in the experience first. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. I would say okay. You, you, don't, you don't change it. I mean, we need people passionate about mm -hmm. agriculture mm -hmm. and food. And if they're over romanticized about it, so be it. You know, um, we are one of our employees right now um, called me up on the phone a year ago and said, I am leaving law enforcement. I want to become a farmer. You know, do you have a job for me? And I'm like, all right. So <laughs> she, she came out and she's been with us a year, which is fantastic for in, in the dairy industry. You know, when you have someone a year, that's fantastic. So, um, I mean, she's gotten more cow poop on her than she's, you know, had, you know, anything else in the law enforcement. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I think we, we just keep that passion mm -hmm. and, and romanticism about it alive, I think, and that's how we draw people in. And yeah, when they get their fingernails a little dirty and they get a cow poop on them, the reality hits. But um, <laughs> you know, people people stick with it because it's, it's it's a calling. Yeah, it's not a job in that sense. You know, it's mm -hmm. not a nine to five job. 
where you clock in and you clock out and you bring home a paycheck and you might get some benefits. It's, mm -hmm. it's a calling. Mm -hmm. And you know, and then that's why I changed careers. Um, you know, to me, clinical dietetics in a hospital became a clock in, clock out. Nobody really cares what they eat. Uh, nobody wants to listen to the dietitian tell you what you can't eat. And um, yeah, so I think for passion, you wouldn't want to, want to squelch that. But there is a reality check to it as well yes, that, yes. to make sure they're cut out for the work. Mm -hmm. Well, if I had a magic wand, I would add two hours to the clock to hear more oh, from yeah. uh, such expert ladies. Um, but it is our time to go, and I want to thank you very much.